Thank you for your patience. We tried to hustle. This morning, if you would take your New Testament and turn to Mark chapter 6, just for a few minutes, we want to look at one of the stories in Mark's gospel. If you don't have a Bible, there may be one in front of you on the chair in front of you, or you can always go online and check it out, or just listen. It'd be okay. So this morning, uh, we are going to just continue some of our thinking as our studying together on the life of Jesus. We're catching him at the beginning of his ministry. You know, over the last few weeks, the last number of weeks, we as a congregation have just been really on a whirlwind tour of Jesus' activities in the early days of his ministry. And so writing this particular account of Jesus' life, there are four of them, the four Gospels, four different accounts of the life of Jesus. In this one, Mark, who was an apostle, who was a, a disciple of the apostle Peter, in this telling of the story, Mark has kept things at a pretty brisk pace, moving along very quickly. So here's where we are. After 30 years of preparation... Jesus has finally gone public, okay? And the public, they just can't get enough. Jesus is always healing and teaching and healing and teaching, traveling here and there from village to town to village, declaring the arrival of some really long-awaited hopes people had. It's come, it's here, it's now. And he's demonstrating otherworldly powers, in miraculous ways. So he's telling this good news message of God's fresh favor. And it had people hanging on every word that he said. And and they're seeing also those words verified with supernatural proof in the miracles. I mean, this isn't this isn't science fiction. It's real. And the eyewitnesses to it, they just keep multiplying and multiplying. And word keeps spreading. And the miracles keep happening everywhere Jesus goes. And Jesus is leaving behind a trail of wounded lives made whole again. And not many people wanted to get left out of that. And so as we follow the story... Jesus' story has started off at a run. And as the story continues, and Jesus keeps healing and teaching, at each stage in the story, the stakes are raised. The intensity climbs. Demons are driven out. Storms are ceased. And then things are raised again. And again, and then the last story we saw where Jesus saw well over, or he fed well over 5,000 people from a small meal of five loaves and two small fish. Somehow he miraculously multiplied that so that everybody had enough and they had even had leftovers. And now this, now this, walking on water. And then after this, more healings, and then more. I mean, where's this all going to end? Where, where, what's going to happen next in the story? Where is this heading? Where is, where is this steady but incredible buildup of astonishing events? Where is it all ending? Where is it all coming to? And the crowds, the crowds continue building as well. I mean, countless people are seeking his attention. And just a chance to get noticed, just a chance to get helped by this young prophet from Nazareth, carpenter turned teacher. And Jesus is exhausted from all of this. This nonstop schedule, day after day after day, we even read at one point they were so overwhelmed they didn't even have time to eat dinner. And he's arrived at this location in the story to get some rest, to get to pray. He's trying to get away to rest and pray. And so after this long, long evening of teaching and feeding more than 5,000 people a meal of bread and fish, 
And now, now with everyone is satisfied, bellies are full, everyone's happy, he's finally able to dismiss everyone and they disperse back to their homes. And then Jesus sends his own disciples, the 12 of them, back across the lake in a boat while he goes the other direction and climbs a nearby hillside to pray alone in the night. Mark 6, look at verse 46. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he prayed. Jesus prayed. So I don't know about you, but knowing that, it's such a helpful window into, the, into Jesus' genuine humanness. That Jesus got hungry, he got sad, he got thirsty, and here we see him exhausted. And feeling in that exhaustion such a deep sense of prayerful dependence on God his Father. He needed help. And so while he prayed, the disciples rowed. Both of them were at it most of the night. Verse 48 says, He saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. So he could see his men, somehow, he could see his men struggling with the oars, the wind having come up against them. And Mark says that it's about 4 o'clock in the morning when the next part of this story we're told about. 4 a.m. in the morning, Jesus comes toward them, check it, walking on the water. Now try to imagine that for a second. Try to imagine being there. Here you are in a boat or in hand pressing against the waves, pressing against the water and the wind, in the middle of the night, rowing and rowing into the howling wind, not getting anywhere fast, dead tired. And out there on the dark, creepy water, your eyes see a ghost. And he's walking right at you across the top of the water. Every one of those grown men screamed, scared out of their wits. Verse 48 says, he meant to pass by them. He was just going to keep on walking. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were terrified. I mean, what would you do? I mean, what, what else would you think? You listen, when, you, when you're in a panic, your mind is desperately grasping at the reality that's happening in front of you. You're trying to make sense of what you're seeing. You ever been panicked, terrified? I remember one of the moments in my life I'll never forget. I was taking some flying lessons about 23, 24 years ago. It was about five hours in, and we were pointing the nose straight up with the power still on, and we just stopped flying, and and it fell to the left and started spiraling toward the ground. I'm in the left seat, and I remember grown man screaming (laughs) with my instructor, and my hands go back, blocking his hands from being able to get to the controls. So I'm making it worse. And so he pulls it out of the spin, But I don't think I remember much else after that past landing. (laughs) Terrified, I cried out. I couldn't even finish my training. Now, I've been up since then. But try to imagine those grown men, salty, seaworthy men, They imagine, their minds are trying to figure out what they're seeing. And they imagine they're seeing a ghost. 
I mean, how else do you explain what they're seeing? Well, Mark does explain it, actually, helpfully for us. And it's not what any of them thought at first. They were seeing something more than they thought they were seeing. It wasn't a ghost. It was Jesus. Their their teacher, their friend. Here he is, hair and robe blowing in the wind, feet walking on top of the surface of the water, stepping over the waves like it was an ordinary walk in the park. I mean, their, their minds are straining to try to process all of this. They've never seen anything like this before. I mean, how can this be? How, how is this happening? How in the world is he doing that? And as they're panicking with fear, he spoke to them. Look at verse 50. He says to them these words, Men, take heart. Courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. In other words, men, it's it's okay, it's okay. You can calm down, calm down. It's me. It's me. Don't be afraid. So what he Jesus is quick to calm them, quick to comfort them. How does he do it? With two wonderful words of reassurance. It's me. It's me. Have you ever walked up on your kids or your spouse, maybe somewhere in the dark, maybe you were at the park or at home or something, and you accidentally startled them, and in their panic, what do you say? You say, it's me, it's me, it's me, it's okay, it's okay. It's just me. That's what he's doing. Those words change everything, don't they? Huh. I mean, they comfort They reassure, they just pull the plug out to drain out the panic. We thought we were seeing a ghost, Jesus. (laughs) But that's the effect that those words have on those men in the boat. Those those two words, it's me. They're safe. They They feel safe. Because he's safe. He's safe. You're safe when he's with you. And that's why his name, Emmanuel, which you hear mostly at Christmas time, but really is his year round name. But that's why his name, Emmanuel, God with us, is what it means. That's why it is so incredibly meaningful to so many of us that his name is God's with me. It's me. Verse 51 says he got into the boat with them and the wind stopped. And they were, they were utterly astounded at that. So, so get the picture. When he, he's walking on the water, they're freaking out. He calms them down, steps over into the boat And the wind ceased. I mean, the wind ran out of breath. But the storm winds of their emotions, they just simply change directions. I mean, they go from being terrified to being stunned. I mean, these guys have taken a dive on an emotional roller coaster. They're overwhelmed with astonishment They're kind of dazed and confused, to be real honest. And the reason they're astonished, the reason is because they just didn't get it. They just didn't get it. I mean, here's Mark's comment on what was going on inside of those guys. Here he is reflecting back after the resurrection, writing about this story. Peter's the one telling it. And... And so, in some ways, you're kind of hearing Peter's storytelling of his own experience in the middle of that story. Verse 51, Mark 6 or 51 says, toward the end of the verse, they were utterly astounded before, because 
they did not understand about the loaves and fishes. But their hearts were hardened. Okay. They didn't understand what he had just done when he'd fed 5,000 plus people with five loaves and two fish. None of it had yet penetrated their hearts. So, hearts still unpenetrated. Listen, that's not just a remark about the disciples. It's meant for us, the readers of this story. Okay? It's meant for us. What have we learned from the story of the loaves and the fishes? Well, here's the first thing I want us to consider. Number one, like the disciples, we have seen and heard so much from Jesus and about Jesus, but often still don't really get Jesus. We've heard about his miracles. We have heard about the things he has said. We, what he taught, the parables, the stories, the sermons. We've, we've heard about that. We've even heard about how he died on the cross in our place to pay the penalty for my sins and your sins. We, we've heard that, many of us. Maybe, maybe some of you have never heard that before. That's why he died on the cross, to pay the penalty that you and I deserved for our sins. We've, we've heard about how he rose again the third day, back from the dead, alive and well, and then he ascended into heaven where he now reigns over the universe. We've heard these things. Now, for the disciples that day, and for many of us, I'm afraid, that knowing and seeing all that about Jesus has often left us something less than totally astonished at Jesus. So in this telling of the story, Mark keeps addressing Jesus' sovereignty over the natural world. I mean, he, he has power like nobody else. He has authority to say things and they happen and to do things that no one else can do. He has power beyond anything they've ever witnessed. See, if the disciples had reflected on the miracle of the loaves and the fish, or if they had reflected on Jesus turning the water into wine, or how he had just calmed a storm with the word, peace be still, or if they'd reflected on how he had healed lepers, or any number of miraculous accomplishments of Jesus, then they might have realized that walking on water wouldn't have been too much of a problem either for him if they had just thought about what he'd been able to do with the rest of the natural world. See, there are two basic things, themes going on here in this story and throughout the storyline of Jesus. There are two basic themes. One is, who precisely is Jesus? And the second one is the fact that the disciples don't seem to be learning their lesson about that in spite of being firsthand witnesses of it all. They're watching it happen with their own eyeballs. And, and they're watching this while this endless stream of sick people are running breathlessly around them to get to Jesus, to be healed, to get in on his power, to get in on his compassion. And they're still in the dark about who he really is. And by pointing that out to the disciples... Mark here in the storytelling is inviting us to ask that question for ourselves. First to ask, if we're just like those disciples, seeing all these facts, knowing all these truths about Jesus, but not drawing the right conclusions about him, after all that we know about him. Or, whether our hearts are softened or even opened, 
to believe the extraordinary things that are happening before our eyes in Jesus' life and in his story. Do we believe? Are we willing? Or are we hard-hearted? The story says more about us in that regard than anything else. And what Mark is showing us is the second thing. Number two, that Jesus isn't like anything before or since. He isn't like anything. Don't take your eye off the ball here. The point of the story is not to blow you away with walking on water or make you skeptical about it. It's to show you who this man is that's capable of such a thing. It's about Christ. Who is he? Who is he really? A man with power like that. All this, all this points to that. It's pointing us to something than we've, maybe more than we've ever seen before. The remarkable things that Jesus is doing point to something more than the things themselves. They're signs. Signs don't point you to signs. They point you to something else. And this, these, is, these are signs, these are miracles that point to the truth that Jesus himself is something more. Something more than anything you've ever encountered before or ever will. He's more than a carpenter. More than a teacher. Much, much more. I mean, his rule over wind and waves, bread and fish, demons and disease. I mean, if if he's sovereign over those things, then he's sovereign over all things. Over the entire world, in fact. I mean, it can't mean anything less than that. I mean, honestly, the only right thing to feel is to be astonished at this. It's the only right thing to feel. And and just like those tired disciples in the boat in the middle of the night, 4 a.m., we also are really without any excuse to remain hard-hearted to this. I mean, in our our scientifically-minded, rational-minded culture... We are generally cynical about the notion of anything or anybody that could possibly break the laws of nature. Like overcoming gravity to the point where your bare feet can stand on the surface of the water. But, but, but what if? What if you're the one who made nature? And you're the one who designed the way it works. What if that were you? What if you're that person? And then you come down to live and walk around inside of it, even on top of it if you want. Well, it seems to me that if you've got enough power to make all this, then wouldn't you have enough power to control it and subdue it under your feet however you please? I mean, if if you've got the power to do that, then don't you have superior power to it? That's what we're seeing here. That's what we are being invited to recognize. To gaze into a mystery far more astonishing than a man walking on water. But to see the man and to see who he truly is, that's what you're invited to see. Mark is offering us vivid insight on Jesus as the world's sovereign ruler, earth's rightful king and maker long longed for, now arrived, heaven come down to earth with arms wide open to the world and putting things right again in the world. 
Listen to the next part of the story because it's not finished. This next section is part of the point here. It says in verse 53, just listen. When they had crossed over the lake, they'd got to the other side. They came to the land at Gennesaret and and they moored the boat on shore. And it says, and when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him. And ran about the whole region and began to bring sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he came, in villages, cities, countryside, wherever he was, they laid the sick in the marketplaces, the the roadside stands where they were selling things. And they implored him, begged him, that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. You know, think about this. Jesus didn't have to do this. But for their sakes, he finished crossing the lake in the boat with his startled friends. He could have walked the whole way. But he finished out with them. And they made landfall. And what was waiting for them at 4 (laughs) a.m.? More crowds. And more healings. More of Jesus setting things right again. One life at a time. That's what he was about. And to grasp all this, it it takes more than just suspending your skepticism about Jesus or your boredom with Jesus. It's actually going to take a complete change of heart. A new one, actually. And fortunately, that's what Jesus came to bring you. I mean, he has, he has power to do that, you know. He has power to reach right down inside of you. I mean, if you've got power to walk on water, come on. He can change your heart. He can change your thinking, your imagining, your praying, even your body and your future Forever. And we're all invited to come, to be part of the crowd, to get in on this. Like the eager people were there that day waiting for him on the beach. And just like them touched the hem of his garment, as it were. What a metaphorical but beautiful way of saying, Jesus, I'm looking for what you've got. I need your help. If I could just get a little bit, everything will be made right. Looking for salvation. Looking for salvation. Folks, it's why he came He came for you. He came for me. Broken, messed up, incompetent people like you and me. And he came to set things right again in our lives for you, for me. He came to set us right with God himself. Because our relationship with God is so broken, so so sideways, so disordered. Jesus came to set that right forever. That's why he lived. That's why he died. That's why he rose again. He did it to offer us real hope. Real hope. Not not a theoretical hope. Not a political hope. Thank God. (laughs) Not an economic hope. It's even better than that. He came to offer us real hope. So we we don't have to hope against hope. Our hope is in a living person. It's me, he said. Not me. (laughs) I'm quoting Jesus. Our hope is in a living person. Listen, our hope is not in self-help. Are you tired of that yet? Are you really getting anywhere? Our hope is not in self-help. Our hope is not in some theoretical proposition. Our hope isn't even in some technological innovation. As much as we are enamored with those things. Our hope is not in that. My hope is not in a better iPhone. Or a rechargeable car. Or AI. Our lives are so much more than those Trivial things. Jesus Christ is the real ruler of heaven and earth. I'm so glad because the ones we've got are terrible. 
He's got more power than you know. Really, more than you know. Back when he died and rose again, he did things. He did things in that, that event of dying and rising again. He did things far more amazing than walk on water, y'all. He defeated the devil and he, he overcame death. He's the one guy who's gone through death and come back again to tell us about it. And one day he'll come again, walking on water-filled clouds to set everything right that's wrong with this world and to make all things new and everything and everybody in it right. That's why he died. And anybody can get in on that. And we do that when we entrust our lives and our future to him. Like those eager crowds just wanting what he has and who he is. So because of who he is and because of what he's done for us, dying and rising again, and what he's going to do for us, folks, not hoping is not an option. We've got every reason to hope. If our hope is in Jesus Christ. Can I pray for you and for me? So Father in heaven, I ask that you would do the work that that I and no one else can do in this moment. And that is that you would reach down inside of all of us and open our eyes that we might understand. And with this simple, beautiful, powerful story about Jesus walking on the water... Would you open our eyes to the truth that's bigger than walking on water? That Jesus Christ truly is the living Son of God, crucified for our sins, raised from the dead, reigning now in heaven for us, praying for us even, being our only hope in life or in death. And so I pray, Father, that you would awaken us Overcome our skepticism, overcome our cynicism, our boredom with you. God, forgive us for that. Would you draw us in, draw people to Jesus to believe, maybe some, some today for the very first time ever, putting all their, all, their, all their chips on him, their whole life, everything, all their hope. I pray that today that they would do that. So, Father... I pray that you would raise the dead, as it were, just as we witnessed earlier in Alan's baptism, picturing being dead in sin and raised to life through faith in Jesus Christ. Do it again, Lord. That's why you came. Do it. And awaken our faith to fresh trust, deep trust in the one who's got more power than we can imagine, Jesus Christ, our living hope. In his name we pray it. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and sing.